today about the impact-based forecast in some scales. In this case, I was asked to cover immediate, short, and medium term. But before I do this, I will tell you about our center. It is quite new. Most of you, since you are meteorologists, you know in Imed and Sepetek, that is the Weather Services and Studies Center. Some of you are not aware with ours, aware of others. I wonder if you remember the Rio de Janeiro disaster in 2011. Probably you've heard it in the news. This was a disaster that took place because there was an accumulated rain in two days of 166 millimeters. That's about 70% of the expected average for the month. So it was quite a hard situation. There were over 300,000 people affected over 900 dead people in seven cities. It was considered one of the 10 greatest landslides of that time. Housing was deeply affected, so people were affected more than anything else. Then transport, water, treatment, and trade. After this event, the government asked itself, what happened? How come we were unaware? How come we didn't have that information? So then the government noticed that there was something missing, especially at national level. So they didn't know how to reach population. So six months later, the government issued by executive order the National Center of Monitoring and Alerts for Natural Disasters. And in several municipalities of Brazil, actually, where these events might occur. And at the time when we were created, we were not created within the science ministry uh, in innovation until later. So we also do research, not only operation research as well, especially trying to produce technological innovation in order to improve our alert system that in the end will contribute with the lowering of fatal victims and damage in the country. And which was the strategy that was set up at the time for risk management? Here you see all the sectors, the state sectors that have the information, all the departments or the provinces that have weather services at ministry level different ministries, the geography and statistics ministry that are in charge of doing risk and vulnerability. And there is also the weather service that does mostly geological mapping. Then they had to do hydrological mapping as well. And also the National Water Agency that has hydrological information of the whole country. So several centers at provincial level, department level, and they are the ones that group everything, and also local communities. And as I was saying, we work with research. So several universities and research centers are involved. So that's how we gather the information. So we have cooperation agreements with all the institutes so that we can exchange information, exchange technology, and so that we can monitor and send the alerts. Our alerts are not directly sent to the population. We send it to Senad, and Tiago tomorrow will be explaining about this a bit. And then Senad rebroadcasts issue, issues to the civil defense that is in charge of mobilization and providing 
assistance. So this is the disaster management center. So that's the path of the information. So how do we work? We work on different timescales, like now, that would be immediate, and we have an operation room that has been working since 2011, although we started in July. So we started monitoring us from December 2011, and we work 24-7, so our office never stops. The operational aspect is always covered. Our main focus is risk alerts for floods and landslides, so that's where we focus our work. We don't do weather alerts. They are done by INEMET, so it's a different office. They are the specialists in that. And we don't have any operational atmospheric model. We use the results provided by other models. So that's also important to bear in mind. We only use meteorological information in order to do our alerts. So far, we have sent over 8,000 risk alerts for Senade at different levels. And at the time, this has been the municipality that we are monitoring. And right now, we're monitoring 958 municipalities, out of which 821 were municipalities that were considered priority because they have a history of disasters. So this is being assessed again. And yeah, it is. And the most important thing is that in order to monitor, we need to know where the risk areas are. So one of the requirements in order to be able to monitor these municipalities is that they have the mapped risk areas. And I'll show them later. And they are mostly for sudden floods, gradual floods, and landslides. So currently, our operational team at the operating room consists of 44 professionals, 12 meteorologists, 12 hydrologists, 10 geodynamic experts, and 10 operators that work on natural disasters. So vulnerability covers these times from 12 midnight till 6 a.m. and so on and so forth. So these are six hour shifts. And we, I'm sorry, I have uh, my slides in Portuguese and mixed with Spanish. So the meteorologists, then, then when they see, they observe a situation, they give a forecast or when there is some rain, they talk with hydrologists, geologists, in order to diagnose the current condition. And then they add to this the forecast, and they work with the disaster specialists in order to build the risk scenario. So then, in this case, the decision making is multidisciplinary. So not taken only by one per person. So there are two briefings a day, so not just one person takes up this decision. And there's a daily newsletter that is usually shared with Senade. And this is our alert level table. So we work with the occurrence possibility, low, high, very high, and the potential impact moderate, high, or very high. So as Jane showed yesterday, 4 by 4, 5 by far, and ours is 3 by 3, a bit smaller. So same matrix or similar matrix. So we have the low possibility of occurrence, but the impact could be very high. Still, it's a moderate level, so depending on the situation. So here, an explanation. What do we consider very high? When we have very, very heavy rain indexes and also that have accumulated water significantly in the past days that might generate landslides or fast floods or 
generalized flats. So it's um, quite unusual. We've issued very high alerts, but they haven't been the most frequent ones. So that more or less is what our alert looks like. It goes to the Senate, which then broadcasts it to the civil defense. And here it talks about the risk situation, the situation, the tendencies expected in the next hours, what's recommended. And here, as I said, we have the mapped risk area, so we can say exactly how many people are in that risk area that we are seeing. So we go to a local scale. So apart from the time scale, the local scale. And within this alert, we provided a link and we requested the civil defense agencies to share information so that we know what's going on, how we can improve our warnings. As the case goes for flood floods, flash floods, it can be really hard. Sometimes we send the alert and then it's too late. It already happened. So that's when for us, it's a critical situation. That's where we have experienced the most losses. So it's vital information for us. So in this context, what happened? Brazil already had a monitoring network, but they decided to expand the network. And they said, we need several areas. For instance, in this region, this is where it's the greatest concentration of disasters. So nine meteorological radars were acquired, also automatic rain meters, hydrological stations, nine robotic stations with over 900 systems to measure landslides movement, but also used not only for operations, but for research. So in order to develop our models. And also we have over 135 geotechnic stations, 100 agrometeorological ones and aqua that mostly are to measure rain and soil humidity that are mostly located at the northeast because they can help us more with droughts because after some time in 2014, as from 2012, I would say in the northeast, we had a very, very heavy drought that went on for about six to seven years so far and also in the southeast region, but mainly this is to come together with the other areas, and that's how we got about it. So that's our current network. Semaden is here, the rain meters, the pluvial meters. And if you can see here, the rain gauge we have as from 1993. So we have almost made it to 2013, since 2013. So we have agreements of cooperation. And you can see the net is a little broader. And so here you see all the institutions where we can find the information. So this is all the data all for rain, so for rain and hydrology. So what do we have, what do we do to have all this information? So we have information that we receive by cell phone, so we have modem chip and so information is transmitted through the cell phone, mostly in the case of pluviometric stations. Radars use, of course, optical fiber. There's a lot of information. And that information is uh, reached in that way. So we process information, and then it reaches through us through Salvar platform. These two systems were developed at SEMADEN in collaboration with another institution. And this system allows us to visualize all the products that we see. I don't have them here, but if you want, I can show them later. 
So this is the one that is used in the operations room to issue warnings. So our stations issue dates on the hour. And when the rain starts, they start broadcasting every 10 minutes. We receive information every 10 minutes. Even so, as I said before, systems lag. So what happens when there's rain with cell phones? The first thing to fall down is the signals for the cell phones. So sometimes we have this delay. So that's why we always have problems. So now we're thinking of implementing another uh, system through satellite or some other way to share information. There are researchers, about 20, I work there as well. And we work on IT people, about 10 now, that help in these developments, helping applications, because the idea is that everything we do is what's the final goal, that it gets to the operation room so that all that has been generated gets there. That's our perfect. And here I would like to show you what we're doing regarding these um, products. People help, but their work is a little different. So they're all talking about no casting, of course. They use the meteorological radars. And we process the radars, the information, 31, I would say, radars. And the idea is to use them in order to have a uh, forecast of up to two hours, and the estimated rainfall is being verified with the stations in which we have the rain gauges. And that's one of the radars in our platform. That's the face that you can see. And the idea is that the operator can click here in one of the pluviometers and compare the rain radar, the pluviometer radar, and then they can check what's the forecast. So this is one of the examples, see? So here is the observed one. The green one is the radar measure, and this is the forecast for the next two hours. But of course, nothing is perfect. So sometimes we need to adjust things. But the idea is that every time we're doing more adjustments. So this is a process that we're still developing. And it hasn't been finalized. But still, the problem continues. Many times, the life of these systems are short. It's less than 30 minutes. And here is where the radio will not work as expected. But we're working along these lines. And here we can have a comparison between the forecast. This was a one hour forecast. This is for two hours. And this is what was observed. So I would say that it works. It's not perfect, but it does the job. It gets the job done. And then a um, few more examples for hydrology. I'm a hydrologist, so that's evidently where my heart is. So CPRM, that is a geological service, they mapped over 4,700 risk areas in that municipality. So for the greatest part, they're in the southeast. And we have a lot of information here. So what do we do? One of the things that we do is find out about the basins in the upper stream to know the size of the basin, the time of concentration. And so that's what we did. These are the risk areas. And some of the ones we see here are not exactly close to the river. So it's still methodology that is being improved. And we talked to the geological service. So this area is a little strange. What could be happening? 
But sometimes we realize that these are areas that have to do with urban drainage, and there are cases of water logging. And we realized that we had basins. Some of them are l smaller than 50 square kilometers, and they can be up to 100 square kilometers. And the response time is practically between zero to four hours. So these are quite fast uh, responses. So when we have that possibility, we work with flash flood thresholds. And here, this here shows you the accumulated rain in one hour. And over here, the rain accumulated in the last 24 hours. So we cross the information, and we find the flood curve and the dots that are here would be then situations that can generate this kind of flash flood. So this is just a quick example. Uh, I was a bit fast. Perhaps later we can go over it again in private. So about short-term hydrological warnings. When they are greater than 24 hours, we use the meteorological model, the hydrological model, to give a warning, be it observation or attention. But if we want to give warnings between 2 to 12 hours, apart from the forecast, we need to use the pluviometers, meteorological radars, also satellite info, together with hydrological centers, we run the model and we see the alert level. We are working along these lines. We don't have info for all the basins because there are lots, but we have some. So this is a distributed hydrological model that we're using. This is one of the basins and this is the observed one. And in this case, just one example with the regional model, IMPES model. And these are several members. So they are a joint um, forecast work. And this is another uh, example for another basin called San Mateo. And you can see here is where there's a click in which we can see what has been shown. And this is the mean average of the flows and this is for all the members. So this information is also observed. We still don't have info for all the basins. And some of the events require the operator with info of the basins and with the characterizations that I expressed. And info is gathered together with rain info. And in this case, for instance, we can see the Madera River in 2014. There was a great flood in the Madera River that lasted, let's say, the river overflowed and it lasted for over three months. It exceeded its usual course. This affected transport and one of the cities that has one important road there, in one of the states, the city was completely isolated, generating great chaos. So then we started to monitor this situation, and one of the problems we face in this area, in the basin of this river, and you know, Bolivia is also affected, it's part of the basin, and we don't get any information from Bolivia, so that's a problem sometimes, and we end up using satellite information, not Bolivian information, so to say. And we do forecasting covering 10, 15 days. And, you know, we are all meteorologists, so you know this. What's the forecast like after 10 days, one month, three months? That's very difficult. It's very difficult in the long term, but everyone wants to know what's going to happen with the river. Will it overflow? So we create scenarios. We, we were with rainfall scenarios from previous years, averages, mean values. So you see here, here's the observational information. Here, these were the forecasts uh, that we developed using those models. And here you have a sequence. We did several simulations with different scenarios. 
This is the only thing we do for the time being. And this is the 2014 flood. That's the overflow line. So you see, it was quite severe. This is all we do for the time being. This was a scenario, I think it was 2018, this year. Yeah, this year, February. We did it in, back in February, and we wanted to find out if the river was going to overflow or not, because people started asking questions, because there were some meteorological situations that might give us an inkling that we, we will have the same situation as in 2014. When did we do the simulation? You see, probably this we did this in February, and we might have had the same, same outcome. So basically, this is all we do now. As I said before, I am a hydrologist, as a matter of fact. But I wanted to show you some of the landslide warnings. And we have over 7,000 risk areas that we have mapped in our maps, in our information. And what we mainly use is the rainfall information. We have the forecasts, satellite information. And in that case, we use a critical rainfall thresholds. Here we have devised some thresholds for some cities from some localities and regions. And this gives us the possibility to issue alerts. You see critical thresholds. That's a quite a big range. Here, Sao Paulo, 80 millimeters, 72 hours. In, on the coast, it's 120 millimeters in 72 hours. So the, this changes depending on the region. You see the threshold is different. And we're still working on this. This is a work in progress. And we're trying to develop models for these estimations. As I said also, we work on a briefing meeting. And we work on geohydrological forecast for the next 24 hours. And we developed this map showing the likelihood of this type of risk. And here you see average. This is moderate. This is low probability. This is the kind of information we disclose every day. This is uploaded on our website. And we, we have big areas. We try to do it twice a day, not every 24 hours, every 12 hours. And this is more short-term uh, short information, I would say. As I said already, we monitor regions where, which are affected by drought. We work together for the National Water Office and some um, local institutes. This is the north of Brazil, over 1,000 municipalities. You see the number. And we are now monitoring some tributaries and basins, especially those watercourses used uh, for drinking water and for uh, energy, for power stations. And here you have the information we use for diagnosis. You see veg vegetation indices, and you have different regions over five years. Uh, I mean, of dry, very dry weather and drought. And the objective is to see the impact of, the, of what my, we might be facing in the coming months. In the case of this drought, you know, in Brazil, we have a special program, Garantia Safra is the name, which helps farmers, uh, agricultural families in the northeastern region. And when they face drought, a drought the state makes a determination. And the government provides some financial aid. So you have to reach the municipal level yeah, because the resource does not go to the farmer directly. It goes to the municipality, and the municipality shares the subsidy. And here you see the distribution, the number of municipalities that are sustaining this drought situation. And this is the way in which they are given some assistance. But this is not the only thing we want. We want to know what, what's going to happen. And we do the same thing here. We develop scenarios based on 
precipitation. For, for instance, this is a quarterly forecast for the or projection for the next three months, March, April, and May. What? Well, if we get rain within the average range, what might happen? That's a situation. And if we get, I mean, rain but 30 below, 30 percent below average, what's going to happen? So you see changes there when we change the variable. So this is one of the ways in which we can say this, that. Otherwise, it's impossible. It's impossible to get a three-month forecast. This is more recent. We developed an integrated drought index, taking into account the SPR and the vegetation condition. And we have overlapped both in order to show exceptional, extreme, severe, or moderate drought. You see the different levels of drought. And here you have the duration. You see these lines on the dotted lines. That's below six months. This is, uh, and the, the rest, that's over six months. So this allows us to see where we should focus our efforts. Here you see the southeast of Brazil, uh, the central area, and the center east. Uh, this is the same thing. We have different scenarios. In here, we, we cannot cover vegetation, but it's just precipitation. If we get average rain or 25% above or below the average, you see the different scenarios. And there are some changes. So this is the general work we do and the types of scenarios that we develop. And of course, we take into account the possible impacts of these situations. Here, medium and long term. Here we have a problem, so we say, yeah, we analyze the situation from the basin point of view. And in this case, we can see examples. These are basins which are quite important uh, for energy. What do we do? Apart from the short term forecast, yeah, we calculate water flow from the tributaries and the reservoirs. And we do some long term, I would say, yeah. And we use this GFSS model, 21 members, and we provide this information. And these are not real forecasts. They are projections. They are based on scenarios. So we provide these projections for water flow and the level of the water reservoirs. Um, the, we've been working on this project for two years, weekly meetings. We had meetings with the National Water Agency. Uh, Inemet, I don't, I don't remember. Inemet is involved in the meetings. The national energy operator, every single state, because this is one of the main basins in Brazil. It's used for electricity. It's also used for irrigation and for I mean, drinking water for the northeast of Brazil, which is semi-arid. So this is the type of work we do. And we work on a weekly basis. And apart from these meetings, we issue some bulletins, these like newsletters. You have an impact bulletin. This is issued by Semaden. Also, I can show you this tomorrow. The Cantareira is the main water basin, yeah, which provides water to Sao Paulo. Back in 2014, we had very serious problems there. Then we have the Madero River and the impact work we do. You can see here where it, let's see if I can show you the map. At some point in time, this state, Acre State, had, had to face serious problems, mainly hydrological issues. And also, we work with this kind of information. They, prov they need this information, especially for the short and medium term. Just a quick summary. Um, 
In the short term, what do we need? We need real-time data because sometimes these are such fast systems that not any meteorological system can predict them. And we use rain thresholds for flashlights and for some landslides. In the short term, real-time data, now casting time based focus so that our information is adequate. And for the medium and long term, three to 10 days forecasts and rain scenes that would allow us to be protected. So that's the way where we are heading. That's what we are doing. I would like to hear from you whether you do things differently and whether we can share experiences Thank you. That's uh, our site and my email in case you wish to contact me. Thank you.